machine. An iron juggernaut generating over 3,000 horsepower. At the opposite end of the track is the opponent, atop a 50 horsepower two-stroke flying machine. At 180 pounds, he's the best motorcycle rider to ever live. He holds records for jumping limos, buildings, and conquered the Grand Canyon. Tonight, he goes head-on against this mighty steam engine. What will happen when the two meet at a combined speed over 100 miles an hour? Find out now. It's the Robbie Knievel head-on train jump live. We are live in the heart of Christian, where everything seems larger than life. And, and tonight, a larger-than-life moment awaits us. Robbie Knievel attempting to jump over this iron horse that you're seeing there, 87 tons of hot iron and steel coming at him head on. He will attempt the jump from this ramp, which is placed alongside and across the railroad tracks. If it goes as planned, Knievel will soar from the engine of the caboose and once again land in the record books and in the permanent memory of all up in tonight. That's the sound of the steam engine. And good evening, everyone. I'm Mark Thompson. We're in Palestine, Texas home of the Texas State Railroad. Joining me is a man you'll all recognize from the NFL on Fox, four-time Super Bowl champion Matt Millen. Matt, this certainly has to be Knievel's most complicated and dangerous jump. Oh, I don't think there's any question about that. And there's a couple of factors as to why. I think the biggest thing is it really comes down to timing. And most of the time when he's jumping, it's over something that's fixed. But tonight, as you can see, it's the train and it's moving. And so not only does the train have to have the right timing, Robbie has to do it as well. And Robbie's usually one of those guys who goes by feel. And when he's ready to roll, he rolls. Tonight, he wants to go when he's ready. It's a little bit different. And then on top of that, you're going to have to have a little bit of maneuverability. He's going to have to maneuver through a couple things at the start, which is going to make it even more difficult. Yeah, we should mention it's sort of just one of those things, but alongside this track, they poured fresh asphalt last night because they needed to replace that grass with asphalt. Well, yesterday we were watching him jumping, and, and it, it became apparent to Bill Rundle, the guy who runs the whole thing, that that little spot right there could be dangerous. And there was a chance that if he got too wide, he could tear out and actually eat that fence, which is not a good thing. I don't believe he's that hungry. But the interesting thing about the asphalt now is that there has to be some concern that the wheels may slip on that fresh asphalt. Absolutely, but they did do a good job of packing it down. Look, the one thing I'll say about this whole jump, and the people you have to know this, is they have been absolutely perfect about taking every single precaution. They've been very scientific about it, and they've been extremely professional, so I'm looking forward to it. There are a couple of things that can happen here. If he jumps too early, Matt, take us through that scenario. Well, that's the tough one. If he jumps too soon, what will happen is he'll get over the he'll get over the train too soon. And on the other end, the caboose, if you look at it, is at 16 feet, which is about four foot higher. And what would happen is as he's descending, the back tire would hit the caboose. Actually, this is the one scenario that's the most realistic. And this is where the timing really has to happen. Now, if he jumps too late, in other words, that train gets too close to the right. ramp. What happens again? The timing factor again. So when he gets too late, the first thing you'll notice is the train beats him there. Train beats him there. That means that the ramp, which is part way on the track, that will hit. And first of all, there won't be a ramp to jump. You don't really want to attempt to jump when there's no ramp. Second thing is, because it's at the 12-foot mark, the top of the ramp, the front of the train is about three and a half feet higher. Again, there's a possibility of him hitting the stack. Well, we saw that stack in that 3D animation we just looked at, and the ramp scenario you've just described is what we're right. going to see now. And that is really a tough negotiation for Knievel because he has to allow the train to get within 40 feet of the ramp, but he doesn't want it to hit the ramp. Yeah, and that, and that is one of the things that's major because that can take the whole thing on, and you're taking on an 87-ton train, and I think that's not something you really want to do. Of the tent. There is so much to this jump, so much more than any other jump, and you may be wondering tonight why this East Texas town is the site of this historic jump, and the answer is in the town's special relationship with the railroad. Deep in the heart of Texas lies the historic town of Palestine. 100 years ago, this was the home of the International and Great Northern Railroad. 
It's a town built by the railroad for the railroad. Palestine is a train town. Today, Palestine has little over 18,000 residents. The glory days of the railroad are over, but the history is well preserved by the Texas State Railroad. Well, it's sort of like a living thing. You can see all the moving parts. You can hear it breathe when it's sitting in the station. You can hear it breathe and whisper. And it's just different than a mechanical uh, internal combustion engine. Steam engine number 400 was chosen to go head on with Knievel. It's 87 tons of brutally powerful iron and steel, built in 1917. The old 400 will start about a mile from the jump site. 360 degree steam will power the pistons and drivers to the predetermined speed. When the locomotive reaches its mark, Knievel will take off. If things go as planned, here is what the jump will look like. As the train works up ahead of steam and comes barreling down the track straight for the takeoff ramp, Robbie will begin his head-on run. As they approach each other at a combined speed of over 100 miles an hour, Robbie's timing must be perfect or the 87-ton train will crush him. A split second after he leaves his takeoff ramp, the train will demolish the ramp. If Robbie has survived his takeoff, he will soar through the air with enough speed and distance to clear the caboose. Of course, that's if everything goes as planned. And we certainly hope everything does go as planned. A lot of planning has gone into this jump tonight. I don't think there's any question about that. And you know, Robbie Knievel, the one thing that really impressed me is how scientific he was about it and the care in which he went about it. Let me make this perfectly clear. This is not some guy who just happens to say, hey, let's jump over a train. This is a professional. This guy knows exactly what he's doing. And I have a lot of confidence after watching him. He's ready to roll. Well, he'll be rolling on the most complicated jump in history. And we will see it live right here on Fox. That's in just a few moments and welcome back the train tonight will be moving 38 feet a second even as you see it in its resting position there Knievel will be moving 110 feet a second the other direction it's a very complicated jump and a special warning to everyone watching tonight. Robbie is a trained professional, and even what he is doing and what he's trained to do takes him to the brink. Do not attempt anything like this at home. We've talked about the problems involved in the takeoff. Matt Mellon is actually on the other side of the tracks, and that is where the takeoff ramp is set up, and Matt can take you through some of those complexities. Matt? Yeah, you know, the biggest thing, we talked about the maneuverability of what Robbie's going to have to do. If you see with the train, the head of the engine is right now, that's coming from a, from a straight-on view. And then what he has to do is get around the water tank, tank and kick this thing and kick it over. This is where it becomes difficult, because if you're going to notice what's happening ahead of us, the ramp, as he takes off, is a little off-center so he can get over the top of the train. In fact, if you look at it and you lined it up head up, it's all the way over here, about maybe 20 feet to the other side of this fence. So he's got to be able to not eat the fence and still get through all five gears. That's going to be the key. He's going to have to kick the fifth gear and get to about 75 miles an hour. Now, as he gets on to his approach, this is where we started talking a little bit about where they put the asphalt down because the asphalt really becomes the biggest part of his on-ramp. Again, he's got to get lined up, and he's got to hit this thing right on top of that. If you notice the asphalt, this is where Bill Rundle, the guy I was telling us about, had to take all that grass out and replace it so that he'd have good traction. In fact, we're going to talk right now to Bill Rendell, who's the, who's the heck, he's the head of everything. He's the captain of Team Knievel. And you've got to like the conditions that you have here tonight. Yeah, we, we really lucked out. Boy, at noon, I, would, I wouldn't have bet we would have had a show tonight, but uh, the weather cleared up like Robbie always says it will, and uh, we're ready to go. Are there any concerns you have going into this thing, Bill? Well, I have the concerns of, the, of turning the hard right turn and, and uh, hoping he gets a bike straight when he does leave. It's... Uh, it's a drag race. we got to beat that train to that takeoff ramp. And the other thing we were talking about when we were out here the other day and we were timing him and just watching Robbie, how he has to maneuver the bike, and really he kind of has to give it pretty much of a lean to hit this thing head on. Yeah, he does. I mean, he's going to have to be leaning really hard when he hits that ramp. He's, he can't let go of the throttle. He's got to stay right in it. Uh, hopefully he won't get crossed up and he'll go out there about 200 feet. One more thing, and that's when he's in the air, you and I were talking about that what he has to maintain, because sometimes the front can get too high. How does he maneuver? Oh, he's got it all figured out. If the bike starts coming up, he'll get on 
grab the clutch and get on the brake and level it out and uh, do it all in a matter of two seconds. So he's the best in the world. We're ready for it. We got confidence. Mark, back to you. Thanks, Bill. All right, a lot to consider tonight, and it's interesting. Yeah, we've all heard the old math problem. A train leaves Paducah at 8 a.m., traveling at 80 miles an hour. How long will it take to get to the Palestine Depot? And we enlisted the help of the University of Texas Mathematics Department to supply Team Knievel with data about tonight's jump, the ultimate in applied physics. Take a look. So what does it take to calculate a motorcycle jump of this nature? We presented the problem to the students of Dr. Ken Gentle, chairman of the physics department at the University of Texas. On the downslope there. When Robbie makes a motorcycle jump, from the point of view of physics, this is a problem in, in mechanics. The fundamental law that governs it uh, is our Newton's laws. Go back to the you know, 1500s. They're, they've been known for a long time. Uh -huh. He is referring to the laws of gravity, along with some other obstacles such as air friction, train speed, and timing. As you will hear, if Robbie's jump is not perfect, the results can be deadly. Okay, well, if he comes off the ramp, the 22 degree ramp at about 77 miles an hour, he's going to be at about 26 feet at his highest point, which will give him plenty of room to clear the train and to get over here at the ramp. Now, the smokestack is 17 feet high, and at what point will the train, can the train be before, it, well, will, will he hit it? From my calculations, it show that if the train is anywhere closer than 17 feet from the point that he jumps off the, the jumping ramp, then his back wheel will hit the smokestack. Well, I suppose there was some optimism there from that mathematics class, but clearly there are a lot of things that can go wrong, as well as we hope a lot that can go right tonight for Robbie Knievel. The jump awaits us. Robbie, so used to jumping on his own terms, but tonight he shares the stage with an 87-ton railroad train. We'll be back. My Italian family loves to answer. So what's new? Oh, they've got a million... We welcome you back to Palestine, Texas. Site of the Texas State Railroad. They've come from Dallas, which is some two hours away, and from Palestine, a town of some 18,000, to see this man tonight, Robbie Knievel. Bill Rundle, you see him there on Robbie's right, is... The head of Team Knievel, been with Robbie for so many years, from the early days as teenagers, actually, they worked together maintaining motorcycles, and Robbie, well, his maintenance days are over. Now he is enjoying uh, great fame for thrilling the world. He's a man who's made so much motorcycle jump history. Among Robbie's most memorable awesome feats was less than a year ago at the Grand Canyon. It would be one of the most dangerous, most dramatic, and most death-defying motorcycle stunts in history. Robbie Knievel was about to try and jump over a rugged 2,000-foot gorge of the Grand Canyon, live on network television, and the whole world was watching. It was originally scheduled for April 29th, but suddenly, without warning, a freezing snowstorm blew in and turned this jump from dangerous to deadly. And team officials forced Robbie to postpone his dream for a month. On May 20th, Robbie proved all his doubters wrong when he fulfilled one of the great dreams in his life. In one of the most spectacular motorcycle stunts ever seen, Robbie jumps the Grand Canyon. the gap, made the distance, but the rocky landing area flipped the bike over head first, sending Robbie into a wicked crash that left paramedics searching for obvious injuries. The replays show that Robbie accelerated faster than anyone on Team Knievel had planned. The faster speed caused him to travel higher. At the arch of his jump, he was over 55 feet in the air. The height of the jump caused his motorcycle to bottom out on the landing, something all the experts say is impossible. But the replay proves it. At this point, Robbie is still in control of his bike, but right here, the uneven rocks on the top of the canyon cause his bike to pop back up in the air. 
once the back wheel is off the ground, Robbie is no longer in control. Right here, you can see the bike bounce sideways and throw Robbie off to the side. And then this bone-shattering tumble. Head over heels at 80 miles an hour. The only thing that stops him is the cactus and the safety bales of hay. Running on adrenaline and having three broken bones, keeping with the pride and tradition of the Knievel name, Robbie is helped to his feet and addresses the live global audience of over 20 million viewers. Robbie actually triumphed over a weather delay back then, and weather threatened to delay this show. Oh, yesterday it was absolutely brutal. We had lightning, we had heavy deal rain, we had high winds, which any time you're in the air, those high winds can kill you. And you can see right now, on the shot right there. Last night it was brutal. In fact, up until the Texas, uh, yeah. Storm. yeah, they do everything big down here in Texas. Tonight, well, hey, tonight it looks like the motorcycle jumping gods are on his side because it is absolutely beautiful. And you can see clear skies, the wind direction. Heck, it's negligible. Right now it's perfect. In yeah, the fact, wind, the, the wind. last time I jumped, <laughs> this is the way it was. <laughs> You'll be jumping for cover. Yeah, that's exactly right. We will get the train in position and Robbie Knievel will emerge. We are moments away from the head-on train jump line as we continue. An alien civilization. I went to they are over 10,000 strong. They have gathered here at the Texas State Railroad in Palestine, Texas. It's the site of the most spectacular Robbie Knievel jump ever anticipated. In the direction of Knievel, It'll be moving 38 feet a second. Robbie up the ramp the opposite direction at 110 feet a second. He'll actually cross onto the track and jump over the train. And if all goes well, he'll exceed that distance of 200 feet and land safely on the opposite side. It's an amazing undertaking. So many dynamics at play here. And uh, earlier tonight, Matt Millen spoke with Robbie Knievel, and it reveals a side of him that uh, you may be surprised by, a, a sensitive side. Take a listen. So all these times that you've, you've had these jumps, you know, there's always at the end, there's a possibility of, of death that has to enter your mind. So where, where does your faith fit in this? Or is there any? Is it just reliance on yourself? <laughs> no, there's total faith. Um, I mean, right away, I think, in this business, I want to live forever. Right. So if I die, I want to believe I'm going to live forever. And as a Gentile, I'm going to have faith and trust in Christ. And uh, that plays a big part because when it comes right down to it, you have all your production company that's used to you. You have all your friends, but there's not a damn thing they can do when you take off and pull that trigger and go for that ramp. So it becomes you and God alone. And the last talk is with him. Okay, man, I love you. It's time to go. I'm going, but I don't have a death wish, and I want to be alive for my daughter, so would you fly with me on this one again? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you did mention your daughters, and, and they're not going to be here for this particular jump, but you have them with you just about all the time, and it's got to be tough for them when they come watch, watch you go down the same way it was for you when you watched your dad jump. Yeah. I, I told him to stay home on this jump because I felt I had more technicalities, whatever, things to concentrate on the jump and when my family's in town I asked my whole family to stay home actually it's I'm thinking about them wondering what they're doing if they're having fun I mean just those little things because I love them and uh, I, I didn't want to worry about them they can sit right home watch me on TV dad's gonna be just fine you know it's funny and I'm, I'm more focused now just totally focused are you afraid well, not maybe not afraid are you concerned that uh, the point where adrenaline kind of takes over and maybe you juice it more than you should? I don't know. It just depends on how calm I am. If I can get adrenaline flow and cocky, then I'll put myself right on target. Right. That sounds like confidence. Put them together. Yeah. Adrenaline flow and cocky. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's AKA confidence. <laughs> This isn't like you just rolled out of bed and decided to do it. We mentioned that earlier. It's something that you've been doing for a long time, and you are professional because this is what you do. Just like the people who fill out your taxes or the people who build your homes, or, that's exactly what they do. This is what Robbie Knievel does, and it's obvious to me that you love it. Yeah, I do. And when I think about getting another job, 
Nah, I'll jump the train tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Have a great one. All right, great. Look forward to it. <laughs> well, there's an insight into those moments before the jump, and that adrenaline cocky thing she talks about, that's the feel that goes with this, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, and that's why I commented about confidence, and really that's what Robbie Knievel is all about. And then the other thing that really struck me is his honesty and straightforwardness, and I, and I like that. I mean, there's not too much fake about him. He tells you and lets you know exactly what he is, and that's the other thing. And then... And then watching him here the last few days, the one thing that really, really struck me is his driving skill. His skills are unparalleled, and, and he'll show you that tonight. He is uh, very committed to children in the community, and generally, wherever he jumps, wherever he makes one of these spectacular jumps, he visits elementary schools, and this was no exception. Well, and you can just see the faces of the kids, the effect that Robbie has on him. And again, this is the honesty and that straightforward that I was talking about, because he speaks from his heart. Just like you saw in that interview, he just sits down and he'll tell you exactly what he thinks. How he feels, he's scared, he's not scared, why he's doing all those things. And I think the kids respond to him, and you can see there, it's, it's always a success. He's very aware of how much a role model he is to all these kids. And as you see, so many of them have collected here. They will hopefully not be disappointed with the action they'll see. Robbie Knievel emerges and makes the attempt as we continue live. And now he is trackside in Palestine, Texas, ready and waiting for the big train jump. And we'll take you back to Texas to see what Robbie's planning for his next big stunt coming up tonight. At you back to Palestine, Texas. That train is backing into position. It will be moving very quickly, 38 feet a second, as mentioned earlier, the other direction toward Robbie Knievel in a few moments. And you can see a couple of the kids in the crowd covering their ears as fireworks go off to signal... concerns you have before you take off no i can't believe uh the storms that were here and what a night this turned out to be and how i've been treated in palestine texas by some of the nicest people in the world thank you you got yourself a dedication who would you like to dedicate this to i'd like to uh dedicate this to my uncle nick who's very sick right now my dad's only brother, I love you, Nick. We all love you from the whole family. And my daughters, Kristen, Carmen, and my little stepdaughter, Brittany, I love you very much. I've been concentrating on all, this all week. That's why they weren't here. Now I'm going to make some runs. The train's only going to come at me once. And that's it, man. Ready to roll. Hey, listen, I don't know. What do you say to a guy's ready to jump over a train? I can't say go break a leg. I've already broke both of them anyway. <laughs> all right, Robbie, go get it. Have a great one. Hey, thank you, man. 
Robbie Knievel appears loose. He's focusing on what he needs to do, and there's a lot he needs to do. And he will do it all right here in Texas when we come back. That is a... That is a very determined daredevil tonight, Captain Robbie Knievel. He is going over to Caleb Daly, who is here. Robbie brought him here. He's at the Make-A-Wish Foundation, and he's here courtesy of Robbie Knievel and Make-A-Wish. So one thing that Robbie had time for just prior to orienting himself for this jump. We are back live. That is Robbie Knievel. He will have no choice as to when to go tonight. That's what distinguishes this jump from every other. Normally... He will take practice runs, and he will go when he feels the moment is right. Tonight, when the train comes, he will have to jump it. There will be no choice. What you're seeing now is Knievel getting the feel of the bike, trying to get the bike up to some decent speeds, and literally getting the feel of things, Matt Mellon. I think he just really needs these practice runs to almost get into something of a rhythm. Yeah, I don't think there's any question about that, Mark. You know, this is the same thing he's been doing the last few days, just to get a feel, especially coming out of those turns. Those turns are the toughest thing for him, and there's a lot of body lean involved, and he just has to get lined up straight. Remember what we talked about, once he gets coming out of that first turn, he's got to bank that thing and then try to get lined up with the ramp so he can hit it head on. Yes, he's really someone who in every other jump, when you think about it, all of them are so spectacular. The building to building jump and the Grand Canyon jump has always at least oriented itself straight on from the start. In this case, I think you really hit the, the, the nail on the head. Two things are critical. Those turns, because they're something he's not accustomed to doing, but also because they throw off the second important thing, and that's the timing. Yeah, and then the other thing that we haven't even talked about, and that's, and that's the landing. And the landing is as critical as anything. In fact, a lot of the times when these things happen, you see the takeoff, you see if everything's fine, and then it gets to the other end. In fact, when you look at the Grand Canyon, that's exactly what happens. He's been fine to the other side. Knievel tends to juice that takeoff. You know, he really wants to make the gap, as he always says. Yeah, no, that's what we were talking about in an interview. We were talking just a little bit about when the adrenaline hits. And, you know, in every sport, I don't care whether it's the NBA, the NFL, whatever, Adrenaline is going to hit you when it's time. When it's showtime, you turn on. And Robbie Knievel is going to have to kind of guard against that because if he goes too far and, and juices it too much, he'll overshoot this thing. It's very funny, man. As we wa as we watched him, and you and I both watched him so often trying to take practice runs. There's no way to practice this without there being so so much of a risk of injury. So he's just taking real sort of half speed runs, if you will, and trying to get the bike up to the position at real speed, but not take the jump. In any case, he was the one variable that kept changing. The train speed was perfect. Everything else was right, but his speed seemed to vary. So I think what you just said is very critical. He's going to have to sort of keep the reins on himself tonight. Yeah, and that's why we spent the last few days timing, and Bill Rundle is right on top of it. They use radar guns. They got everything down so that he could get a feel. Keep in mind, he's riding this bike, and there's no speedometer on it. This is pure feel by Robbie Kinney, and that's why he's been here the last few days and, and practice and practice to get it exactly right because, like all good athletes, it comes down to feel. You know, that's a tradition, a Knievel tradition, the no speedometer. Evil Knievel had no speedometers on his bike either. Many other motorcycle daredevils, many others who attempt jumps, have two speedometers on their bikes. But as uh, Matt just alluded to, Robbie doesn't have any. He's signaling someone over. I would imagine it's someone from Team Knievel. That's actually someone with the Texas Railroad that Robbie is speaking with. And I'm unclear as to exactly what what Knievel wants, but he may see something. That's Bill Rundle he's speaking with, Matt, and maybe they see something and he'll straighten it out. You know, Mark, the one thing we were speaking of the other day is he said that his father, number one, rule number one that his father taught him was safety first. Above all else, safety first. And so as he's taking these practice runs, keep in mind, this is the first time that we have it lit this way that he's, that he's actually taking the runs under the full lighting. Last night with the storms, we couldn't quite get the whole thing done. And so I imagine right now he's going to get all the safety part, make sure that that's 100% as much as he can control, because once he juices it and he's in the air, it's out of his hands. Bill Rundle, as you saw, has a flag in his hand. There's a reason he has a flag in his hand. He's in communication, and the only way to do it is sort of the old-fashioned way with the 
railroad train, and the men at the front of that train passes a critical railroad tie, Bill Rundle will get a flag signal. Once Rundle gets the signal, he will signal Robbie Knievel. It's at that time Knievel will begin. So that'll be the sequence of events. Mark, the other part to that is the train itself, they can't really gauge ex the exact speed. So they have to be going between 25 and 30 miles an hour, about 40 feet per second. And it's not like you could just set this thing. This is an old-time steam engine. It's a diesel power. And so he's going to try to get it, and the, and the uh, engineer himself has been running his train for over 20 years. So he himself has a feel, the same as Robbie Knievel. And again, it comes down to the timing that we've been speaking about through the whole show. And once again, the timing of that train was perfect. In almost every run, it was within two tenths of a second, and that's the sort of accuracy that the engineer will need tonight to make this jump come off successfully. Robbie talking to Bill Rundle again, and it would appear that final preparations are in order. It doesn't look like anyone's very panicked on Team Knievel in terms of something last minute happening. Bill is getting into position. He's yelling, here we go. So I think this will be the run, Matt. Well, I'm downside waiting for him on the other side, just looking at the landing area, and I gotta be, gotta tell you, it's not that impressive. There's, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff kind of strewn all over. You'd think that, uh, you'd think that it was maybe ready a little bit better than it is. Now let's just hope that he makes it cleanly to where you are. The train is four cars and the engine, what's called the tender, that's that thing behind the engine that kind of holds all the fuel and the steam. There's 5,100 gallons of, of water to make the steam. And that is the Texas Railroad man who will... Oh, there's the whistle, Mark. He's ready to roll. Flag is up. And it would appear things have begun. Robbie again will get a signal. As soon as the cow catcher, that pointed end of the train, passes a critical, a specific railroad tie. That indicates the train has... Rounded the curve has reached the speed, and then Rundle will signal Robbie to go. On board that train, you can see it's rounding the curve now. And you can see that flag, man, crouch down right-hand side of your screen. Again, Knievel will be going 110 feet a second. The train, some 38 feet a second. The train will have to come within 40 feet of the platform. He cannot jump before that point, or he'll have jumped too early. He can't not jump any later, otherwise he will hit the train. Here it goes. Knievel is on his way. Here comes the train. He's off! Robbie Knievel has got it! Robbie Knievel has got it! A clean landing! to the Grand Canyon jump. He's up running. A triumphant Knievel takes his run up the landing strip and the crowd, the crowd is jubilant. It, I must say, looked for a moment as though the train was going to get to the platform early. Matt Millen is with Robbie now. Matt? Robbie, could it have been any better than that show? That was close. <laughs> hey, Jesus Christ, you're my Lord and Savior, man. I love you. I love you, Chris and Carmen, Brittany, Uncle Nick. Uh, happy birthday. Peter Fonda and Becky, Pam and Peppy, we love you. Oh, it couldn't have been any better. In fact, I'm thinking maybe we set it up again. And just a lot of my friends back in Washington, seven seers. I love you, man. Whoa! No. That thing got, that train got a little closer than maybe we wanted it to, didn't it? I tell you, I was looking back and I saw that train right in his, right in his oh, face and I'm like, get off, get off, hey, get off. buddy, I would have blamed it all on you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely perfect shot. You hit it perfect right to the middle of the ramp. 
Things went beautiful. I got John Paul DeJoria from Mitchell Hair Products flew in on his jet today. His partner, CB. And we're all going to Sturgeon's. Kenny Jolica. Next jump's for all the girls, you guys. They say. <laughs> Speaking of the girls, your daughters are watching. you got to have something for them. Here's well, a shot Tristan, from... I know the kids at school give you crap and say, your dad might die tonight. God's always watching over That's me. Right. I'll see you next time, little girl. I love you. I'll be there for your confirmation. Bye-bye. Marco, back to you, Mark. What an, what an amazing moment. You can imagine the exhilaration. There's sort of uh, an eerie calm over Knievel, having, I guess, just been so pumped for so many days now. And you can see him being congratulated by everyone who had anything to do with this jump. I want you to take a look at the replay. Look how close the train comes to that platform. From my vantage point, right along the tracks, I tell you, I was extremely worried that the train would take out the platform prior to his takeoff. And then he avoids juicing the bike so much that he lands too far down the platform. He lands cleanly in the center. Take a look at this landing. One of the things that Knievel has had problems with, if you will, is that he lands so far down the platform that he essentially bounces off the bike. The bike has nowhere to go, but in this case, he landed perfectly. And this is the train coming at the ramp. You can really get a sense for how daunting this must have looked. Through the smokestack. And then that is what happened to the portion of the ramp that was extended over the tracks. Yet another angle. This is right on the ramp. You can see him take off and head across. Spectacular. Just spectacular. Finally, this looks like his helmet cam. Is that what this, this is? Oh, this is on the train, I should say, yeah. Well, we know what would have happened, and that very dramatically illustrates it. But Robbie Knievel had some amazing moments. I've got to think Team Knievel is pumped tonight. Matt Mellon for Bill Rundle. Billy, you know, you and I were talking about it a little bit there, and it was, in fact, I, from my vantage point, it looked like the train was going to beat him. That had to be a major scare. Well, you know, we, we planned it so that train would be on him. I never realized that it was going to be that close. I looked back, and I was going, harder, Robbie, harder. And the minute I saw him kick and I saw the train touch, I knew he was going to get over the stack. Uh, unbelievable jump. You know, he hit it. He, you know, just talking to him as he came off, he said his tire was started spinning on the back, and he had to get to fifth and then really hit it down the stretch. You could see when he did hit it that he did finally accelerate. Yeah, I knew we knew that uh, he was going to spin, but uh, I, I, I thought for sure that he'd the train would be a little bit further away than it was, but uh, we made it, so we're uh, looking for the next show, I guess. That was, in fact, I said to him, what the heck, and that thing, we may as well just... Put this thing right up right now and give it another whirl. It would look that easy. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> How about you? I want to go home. <laughs> All right. Mark, back to you. Like you scared the living daylights out of me is what you did. He came up to me and he said, yeah, I came close, didn't I? On all the speed runs, I could see the train. Then I'd see Bill drop the flag. And uh, I spun like crazy on the takeoff. And uh, I made up for it coming down the deal. I saw the train. I said, oh, heck with it. I was going to back out. And, That's what and wait for another run and just let him destroy the ramp and put it back up. I want you to take a look at this replay as you speak. Because you, they were worried is, about you losing your traction. You're saying you're Yeah, I back lost up. a ton of traction. That was unbelievable. <laughs> Unbelievably close. I knew it was soon. I hit the back brake as soon as I got in the air because I was way high because I was accelerating it off, off the ramp like crazy and I killed the motor. So you come down twice as hard. Come on! What is your feeling? You've got to tell me, is that it? Is it just incredible exhilaration? No one can ever imagine it, can we? Take a couple days to uh, come down. Oh, there's that caboose. Almost nailed me. The caboose is 16 <laughs> feet high. We were worried very much that you might hit it on the way down. Yeah, I was a little more worried than you. You know, I'd like to just watch one of these ones. I think you'd fit my leathers perfect. I could talk. <laughs> Not a chance, my friend. I can announce this show. <laughs> <laughs> look at the... Uh, Look at the landing and how perfectly you nailed it. I mean, yeah. we were worried. Uh, the other well, there's some stumps in the grass down there, and them guys told me, why don't we take these out? I said, ah, I ain't even going to be around them. I wasn't going to crash at the Grand Canyon either. That was, uh, <laughs> it was remarkable. It was remarkable. Bill Rundle, what a, what a moment of exhilaration. All the planning, and, uh, and Robbie nails it. Oh, it was beautiful. I'm glad it's over. He did a hell of a job. We need some of that Paul Mitchell road game, pal. I know. <laughs> you know, if they're kidding, they're, everybody's happy. Look at how close you came right here. That's the train. Right through the steam and everything. Wow. 
You guys, the producers turned the steam on. They weren't supposed to. No, I'm just kidding. I had an idea they were. The reality I felt a thing. A, a long shot. I'll tell you, for a moment, my heart stopped because you were so close to that train. I just, and I just eyeballed it and I said, I don't. I think the train's gonna hit the platform. Did it, did it? I thought it was too when I uh, was headed for the takeoff ramp, but I got all my power back in fifth gear and just said, "Heck with it, I'm going." Thanks, thank you, you and Matt, man. You guys are great. You never disappoint us, Robin. <laughs> never disappoint us. <laughs> hey, Moe's. Congratulations, man. Moe's, the driver of the train tonight. I'm trying to get him to drive my bike. You know, I'm, like, you know, I'm the only white man that can jump. That's you can jump the bike easy. Let me drive the train. Moe's, tell right. me what it looked yeah, like from inside that train. Bucks. Look great. Yeah. 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 Were you nervous as you no. came in? No. <laughs> I'm right on schedule. And he probably, he'd be on schedule. Oh, we're right on schedule. You're always right on schedule. There was yep. this guy I was worried about. Oh, yeah. Thanks, man. Yeah, yeah, thank Love you, man. You. Okay. Most, take a look at the tape. This is from your vantage point. Oh, is it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> could have turned out could have turned out so badly, and it turned out so terrifically. What a thrill. Right, right, right. Yeah. Texas Railroad, State yeah. Railroad. All right. Thank you. Moses is here at the Texas State Railroad, and uh, okay. you can see him. Visitors come from miles around, and now there's a new piece of history that was written here tonight. Everybody on Team Knievel and everybody on the Texas Railroad congratulating each other. An amazing night. Matt Mellon, I don't know what it looked like from where you were standing, but from where I was standing, well, I was very close. Well, my, my son Marcus and I were standing on the other end, and as it I started to approach, Marcus said, I don't know, Pop. <laughs> and, I, and it looked to me like that train was going to take it. And then all of a sudden, through the smoke, you could see Robbie coming over the top. I watched the landing. And remember, in the, on the Grand Canyon jump, the landing is what got him, but he was perfect. The only thing really that, that, that went wrong was maybe we had the hay bales a little bit too close. Other than that, heck, he got up, he jumped fine. He said, let the bike. He was fired up. In fact, he's still fired up, and he should be, because that's as good as it got. Yeah, it's funny, you know, if you, if you keep the hay bales too far back, then he, has the, he runs the risk of sort of going down in some of the rocks and debris back there that you were referring to. But he nails the landing perfectly. He was perfect. You know, the thing is, about when you watch this and you watch the jump, you know, I've never really been around any of this stuff. And when I first got down here and I watched Robbie, a couple things hit me. First of all, you could see he was a professional. He knew what he had to do. Again, very scientific about how he approached it. And then as he got ready to do it, he took his practice. He knew he was it was his time. He was ready to roll. He hit it perfect. And when he got to the other side, he knew it was perfect. What a thrill. Matt, thanks so much for hanging hey, in. My play, that was fun. It Let's was do it again. Fun. Yeah. We will do it again, I suspect. Really something special tonight. For Matt Mellon and I'm Mark Thompson, everybody on the Knievel crew, it's just been a great, great night. We thank you for joining us. And we invite you to stay tuned for the secrets of street magic finally revealed next on Fox. Tonight, some incredible thrilling moments revealed here in Texas. Good night. Christopher Titus.